I'm Robert George, and I have the honor to be the director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, which is sponsoring uh, this, uh, today's conference. And we're uh, delighted uh, to be hosting a conference to uh, mark and celebrate the 20th anniversary of the publication of Professor Joseph Rass's great book, The Morality of uh, Freedom. Uh, when I arrived as a graduate student in uh, Oxford in the early uh, 1980s, Professor Rass was already uh, one of the world's great philosophers of law, but he had already begun uh, publishing at that point some works in uh, political philosophy articles and writings in political uh, philosophy, and so all of us uh, were looking forward to the publication of the book uh, The Morality of Freedom, and when it was published in 1986, of course it had an extraordinary impact establishing Professor Raz as uh, one of the great political philosophers uh, in the world as well. Uh, I recall, and perhaps Jeremy Waldron will recall this uh, with me, uh, wondering when the book would come out in paperback. <laughs> Anybody who is or has been a graduate student will know what's behind uh, that question. And I remember Jeremy going to Joseph at one point and asking him, when will the book be out in paperback? And, and he said, have faith. <laughs> and we had faith, and eventually it did come out in paperback. But we're delighted to be celebrating Professor Raz's great achievement and particularly delighted that Professor Raz is with us to help us uh, celebrate and will be speaking this afternoon in response to the papers and presentations that are given. Uh, we launch our deliberations this morning uh, with uh, two distinguished people we're de just delighted to have back in uh, Princeton, both with strong Princeton uh, connections. Uh, professor Jeremy Waldron, who's university professor at New York University, who has taught at many other uh, institutions, Columbia, uh, University, Bolt Hall Law School at Berkeley, and uh, here, at, uh, here at Princeton, of course, Professor Waldron needs no introduction. He is one of the great legal and political philosophers in the world, and it's wonderful to have him uh, back with us. And our former graduate student at, uh, at Princeton, Alex Tuckness, who is now a professor at the University of uh, Iowa, who did a wonderful thesis when he was with us uh, on uh, Locke, which drew great praise from none other than uh, Professor uh, Waldron. So uh, we, will, uh, we will begin. Professor uh, Waldron uh, launches us, and then Professor Tuckness will respond. Jeremy? Thank you very much. I was at Oxford in the late 70s and early 80s and was officially working with Ronald Dworkin, which, as anybody will know who has worked with Professor Dworkin, means that you spend an awful lot of time on your own. And one of the, as it turned out, one of the most important turning points in my time at Oxford was a um, message from Joseph asking whether we could meet and talk. And uh, it made an immense difference to my time at Oxford to have Joseph's informal guidance and mentorship and to join the, the community, a very happy community, of good friends who are also working with him. So it's in that spirit that I offer this, this uh, uh, paper this morning, a spirit of thanks. So, um, in a number of essays, quite recent essays, Joseph has explored the relation between collective goods and individual well-being in um, a paper called National Self-Determination, which he wrote with Avishai Margalit. Joe considered the relation between the, um, the well-being of certain kinds of social group, encompassing groups, Sorry and the well-being and autonomy of their members. He argued, on the one hand, that the prosperity of a group depends on the flourishing of its culture. And he argued, on the other hand, that the interests of the members of the group, their interest in the self-respect and the prospering of the group, are among the most vital human interests that individuals can have. He concluded that for some cases this might lay the foundation, might lay the foundation, for an argument in favor of a right of national self-determination for the encompassing group. It needs to take care of its own culture and uh, in, uh, in accordance with its own uh, way of thinking about the trajectory of the development of that culture. Certainly, he said, this argument indicates that greater attention ought to be paid to the integrity and flourishing of distinct cultural forms than individualistic liberals have sometimes supposed. <clears throat> 
And that last proposition is also the conclusion of Joseph's essay, Multiculturalism, a Liberal Perspective. Both of these essays are in the, the recent collection, Ethics in the Public Domain. In that multiculturalism essay, he argues that in a multicultural society where there, where there is no real possibility of distinct national self-determination uh, for separate groups, the prosperity of each of the cultural groups ought still to be a matter of public concern. Membership in cultural groups is of vital importance to individuals, he says, because it is only through being socialized in a culture that one can tap the options, tap the options which give life a meaning. Well, that's in some of the essays that were published in Ethics in the Public Domain, um, which came out in 2001. But very important elements in the argument that Raz is making in these essays can be traced back to the morality of freedom, which we are supposed to be talking about this morning. In particular, to those sections of the chapter in the Morality of Freedom entitled Right-Based Moralities, in which Joseph argued that the ideal of personal autonomy entails that collective goods are at least sometimes intrinsically valuable. Now that's the argument I want to touch on, consider uh, this, uh, this morning in this paper. To anticipate, I'm actually not convinced by Joseph's argument about the connection between the value of autonomy and the value of certain cultural or collective goods. I hope this is not just because I oppose the general tendency of the arguments that he builds in it in the two essays that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks. In a number of other papers, I have attacked the idea that the integrity of particular cultural frameworks is essential for individuals' well-being. It's a sort of a cosmopolitan argument against minority cultural rights. I've attacked that mostly in what you might call its Kimlikan manifestations, but since the opportunity has arisen, I might as well say something about the Razian version uh, as well. But I, I do think there are also just interesting, almost formal issues about the Razian argument in the morality of freedom. So that's what I want to begin by talking about. The argument in the morality of freedom is that we cannot regard autonomy as valuable or important without paying attention to the conditions under which autonomy can be exercised. Some of those conditions refer us, of course, to the options among which a person chooses in exercising his autonomy. A person is autonomous, says Raz, only if he had a variety of acceptable options to choose from. And he goes on, if having an autonomous life is an ultimate value, then having a sufficient range of options is of intrinsic value, for it is constitutive of an autonomous life that it has lived in circumstances where acceptable alternatives are present. The word acceptable is important for Joseph's overall view, for he believes that a choice among morally unworthy options or a choice between one good option and other unworthy options is not a personally autonomous choice worth respecting. This aspect of his theory, which generates the famous liberal perfectionism of his book, has been extensively discussed, and it's not what I want to focus on here. Acceptable options does, however, mean that the options must include complex projects, actions that involve dense relationships with others. He says we should be able both to choose long-term commitments or projects and to develop lasting relationships and be able to develop and pursue them by means which we choose from time to time. It's intolerable that we should have no influence over the choice of our occupation or of our friends, and as those sort of um, complicated options uh, that are involved in the choice of a career or profession, or the choice of a um, lifelong friendship that uh, I think are particularly salient to the cultural argument. The acceptable options, in other words, are likely to include participation in complicated social practices. Joseph uses the example of careers or professions and the institutions and practices they involve he says one cannot have an option to be a barrister or a surgeon or a psychiatrist in a society where those professions and institutions and the institutions their existence presupposes do not exist. You can't have an option to be a barrister unless there's a profession of law and law courts and the whole business of the rule of law. One cannot be an architect unless there is sort of a practice of the professional design of buildings 
unless there is an established practice with a role for me to play with a set of expectations and an intelligible form of life associated with that role, then being an architect or a barrister can hardly figure among the choices involved in the exercise of my autonomy. Joseph then wants to go on to argue that many of these social options have to be understood as collective goods and that their value cannot be grasped within the pinched metric of liberal individualism. These are goods to people, but they are not goods to people, as it were, one by one. They are goods enjoyed by us uh, together, and that seems to be an essential, not a contingent fact about them. And that is important for the moves that Joseph makes against moral individualism in this chapter of the morality of, his, of freedom and for his refutation of the idea that there can be a plausible, wholly right-based uh, morality. And again, I, I was convinced and am still convinced by the argument that there are certain communal goods that really cannot be accounted for within the metric of individual rights. So I don't want to deny that this morning. It's a connection between the collective goods and autonomy that I want to focus on. I have some formal criticisms to make of it and some substantial criticisms to make of it. Let's look at the formal difficulties first. The move from the premise that autonomy involves the existence of social and cultural options to the conclusion that if autonomy is valuable, then social options are valuable too depends on a claim about constituent goods. Raz says things are constituent goods, which is a subset of intrinsic goods, if they are elements of what is good in itself which contribute to its value, that is elements but for which a situation which is good in itself would be less valuable. Here is the point of disagreement. I don't think now that something is valuable just because it is a constituent of something that is valuable. You know, I say, I say that, that's what I think now. In the, in the, uh, the mid-1980s, me and my friends would go around Oxford and we'd pick fights with people in the street or in the covered market and argue with them in a way that bewildered them. And as we walked away, we would chuckle to ourselves, oh, this fellow obviously doesn't know about the difference between constituent and ultimate goods. And, and, and uh, we, we, we were very pleased with ourselves that we had learned this vocabulary. Um, but let's put some pressure on it. Um, think of some examples. The life of a barrister, a lawyer, is a life of considerable value, but one of its constituents, one of the elements indispensable for its existence, is the existence of disputes that require litigation. Yet surely we would not want to say that the existence of disputes is valuable because being a lawyer is valuable. On the contrary, the existence of disputes is a bad thing that's why being a lawyer is a good thing, if you see what I mean. And examples of this type can be multiplied along very drearily familiar lines. The existence of disease is an indispensable element in explaining the value of medicine. But nobody would say that disease acquires constituent value on this account. On the contrary, the value of medicine depends on disease having negative value. That's why medicine is important. In other words, value is not always transferred from valuable whole to constituent element. Perhaps my examples are misleading because although one can't be a lawyer unless there are disputes requiring resolution, the existence of such disputes does not contribute to the value of the life of the lawyer. But the way the morality of freedom sets it out seems to define contribute purely in terms of necessary conditions, elements but for which a situation which is good in itself would be less valuable. Elements but for which a situation which is good in itself would be less valuable. There is no doubt that the life of a barrister would be less valuable if there were no real disputes to be resolved. If there were no real disputes to be resolved, it would be a frivolous life, not a valuable one. So the value of the barrister's life depends on the serious disvalue of the disputes to which he turns his professional attention, just as the doctor's Professions value depends on the seriousness of the diseases and injuries that have to be dealt with. So I, I suspected that there might be a mistake here. Mistake. I think my criticisms are involved in a particular view about organic goods which differs from Joseph's, uh, what we used to call organic goods. Um, and I draw some inspiration from the discussion in Chapter 1 of Moore's Principia Ethica, 
Moore there in his discussion of organic goods was concerned to show that the value of a whole is not the same as the sum of the value of its parts and is not even proportional to the value of its parts. Now, Raz is not guilty, certainly, of maintaining these particular claims that Moore is attacking. But in his argument against these claims, I think we find that Moore argues, in effect, against the idea of constituent goods. He argues that not only may an organic value good have a value quite out of proportion to the value of its parts considered separately, but also it may have a value despite the fact that one or more of its parts has no value at all, or even negative uh, value. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in any detail. Uh, you can read it yourself. It's all uh, online these days, Principia Ethica. But, and, and the sainted Moore is not our prophet, and something is not true uh, about organic goods just because GE Moore says it is. But it seems to me um, plausible that we want to be very, very careful about in, 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 when we're talking about a complicated uh, good like autonomy in simply uh, moving from the fact that autonomy is good to any of the conditions which uh, are indispensable for its importance being good because some of those conditions may well be uh, um, uh, have, a, have a different shape to them. I, mean, I suspect there's actually something quite fishy about inferring the value of options from the value of choice, which in a crude way is what is going on here. The tenor of much of Joseph's discussion in the morality of freedom is that choosing itself characteristically and properly takes place under the rubric of better and worse. One chooses X rather than Y because one judges X better than Y, and I think he's right about that. But if X and Y are the only elements in the choice set, then as constituents to the value of choosing as such, they contribute equally to the value attributable to choice as such. There cannot be a choice between X and nothing, so the existence of option Y is indispensable for choice, and since the existence of Y is indispensable for, for choice, it follows, at least by the constituent goods doctrine, that if the choice or the choosing has value, then Y has constituent value just as X does. And this is supposed to be the case, presumably, even if, it, as it turns out from the chooser's perspective, X is a better option than Y. I think this is sort of a distraction from what's going on from the chooser's perspective. The chooser is trying to concentrate on everything which is important about this option and that option. And the fact that one or both of them is important as a constituent in his choice set, important just by virtue of being a constituent in his choice set, it seems strange to think that that itself would be taken into account as one of the merits, but he wants to focus on all the merits. So something has to give, and I think what should be given up is the claim that X and Y have constituent value just because they are elements constitutive of choice as options when choice has value. There's a connection here with an argument I made years ago in an article called A Right to Do Wrong. To attribute value to choice is to take choice seriously. To take choice seriously is to pay utmost attention to value differences between the options over which the choice ranges. But the claim that options have value simply as constituents of the choice situation obscures this. The options may be necessary, indispensable for there to be a choice situation, but that does not contribute or affect their value. That's the sort of the formal argument. And at 9.30 in the morning, it's, it's, uh, it's probably going to be uh, mysterious and inconclusive. What happens to Joseph's arguments in multiculturalism and national self-determination if we abandon the claim that cultural practices are valuable as constituent goods simply on account of their constitutive relation to the good of autonomy. What happens if we abandon that formal claim about the relationship between the value of autonomy and the value of the options? Actually, not much. Actually, not much, because Joseph can still make the argument that never mind whether we use the language of constituent goods or not, the autonomy and flourishing of individual human beings does require the maintenance and flourishing of cultural frameworks. And even if we don't want to use vocabulary that's going to get us into trouble with GE more, we can still say, well, that requirement uh, is still important and to be taken notice of, and no one can be seriously committed to autonomy without taking this requirement of the maintenance and flourishing of cultural frameworks seriously to do. He can just say that directly without a detour through the concept of constituent value. And that's actually what, what Joseph does in the essay on multiculturalism, though he does 
indicate a reference to the argument and the morality of freedom, he really doesn't rely on it to any extent. The argument of the essay simply is that freedom depends on options which depend on rules which constitute those options, and those dependence relations are all that he needs to lay the ground for the next stage in the argument which shows that options presuppose a culture. Now, Joseph's argument that freedom requires socially constituted options is perfectly convincing. And if options are socially constituted, then each of them is a cultural product. That's convincing, too. Where I do have difficulty, and now it's substantive difficulty with the thesis, is with a further claim that Raz makes about the importance to particular people of particular cultures. Raz, as far as I can tell, thinks it important that all the options over which an individual's autonomy ranges are structured by a single culture, or should be structured by a single culture, or it would be best if they were structured by a single culture, so that the individual's cultural membership would determine the horizon of his or her opportunities. He thinks, therefore, that um, and this is a quotation, it's the interest of every person to be fully integrated into a cultural group and that the material and cultural prosperity of that group is of great importance to the member in defining the whole array of options that he will be considering. Uh, among the prosperity of a particular culture determines the richness and variety of the opportunities that the culture provides access to. And Joe's conclusion is that only by virtue of an individual's being socialized in a particular culture and only by virtue of that culture's flourishing can the individual in question tap into the options which give life a meaning? In short, he wants to say, autonomy depends on cultural options. Cultural options depend on the flourishing of particular cultures. So a responsible and open-eyed commitment to autonomy may require and probably must require something like the protection of particular cultures. And that's where I have my doubts. Think of the notion of a particular culture. A particular culture may be understood as comprising an array of options and an array of beliefs, practices, traditions, roles, institutions, etc., associated with the way of life of a particular people. In a modern, diverse society, there are many such cultures. There may be one or more mainstream or dominant hegemonic cultures among the people or peoples who are dominant in the society. And there may also be various indigenous cultures, immigrant cultures, cultures of other ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. Each of these can be identified, individuated, at least in thought, and referred to as a relatively distinct and enduring social entity, enduring over time, subsisting in the actions and practices of large numbers of people, and encompassing many, if not all, aspects of social life. Of course, each particular culture will have its own internal fault lines, its dissenting sects, its heretics, its alternative forms, its contestation internally as to the direction of growth and development. And in a modern society, the boundaries between different cultures are likely to be fuzzy and porous, to say the least, not to mention contested. But none of this is true to the extent that it makes it impossible, I suppose, to individuate cultures from one another. Individuals do this all the time as they identify with one culture or other culture in the course of the lives that they lead in the wider and diverse society. And Joseph does have an interesting discussion of identity and identification in this sense. That cultures are more or less vaguely distinguishable from one another in a diverse society is something we can concede. That people do identify with particular cultures is indisputable. But I don't accept the claim that Joseph makes about the actual importance of particular cultures. I don't think it's essential for autonomy that each individual choose among options defined by a single culture, whether it is the culture of that individual, whatever that means, the culture in which he or his parents were raised, the culture with which he identifies, the culture that is likely to be ascribed to him by others. People can and do choose from an array of socially defined options defined by many cultures. Some prefer to choose from an array of options defined by a single culture, but that preference, which may or may not be healthy, may or may not be authentic in the circumstances of the modern world, that preference is insufficient to establishing that the flourishing of particular cultures is indispensable for meaningful choice or autonomy. I'm not even sure that any particular option 
is necessarily associated with a single culture. A given option may be a hybrid or a product of the boundary region between two cultures. Think of somebody who works as an indigenous advocate in the United Nations. Right? It's, it's a, silly to suppose that his whole identification is with his um, people when most of his life is spent over on East 42nd Street there and in institutions which are the product of a whole array of cultures coming together. A given option may be reflective of the difficulty of distinguishing between two or more cultures or of the necessity of living with one foot in both. But even if each particular option is associated with a single culture, the set of options from which most individuals choose need not be associated with a single culture. Hence, as I once said in criticizing a similar claim by Kimlicka, we need cultural meanings, but we don't need homogenous cultural frameworks. We need to understand our choices in the context in which they make sense, but we don't need any single context to structure all our choices. To put it crudely, we need culture, but we don't need cultural integrity. Our options may be given by the ragged remnants of cultures, by the hybrid overlaps of cultures, or one option may be given by one culture and one option given by uh, another. I think Joseph is perfectly well aware of this argument, and he makes, I think, a fairly vigorous case against what I have just said. He says that the social practices which constitute our options do not come one by one in the way that I've just suggested. They are integrated with one another in a densely connected array. And he says that's what cultures are, conglomerations of interlocking practices. Now, this does not quite get him to the position on which he and I disagree. Raz wants to say it's important for each individual to choose from among the options defined by a single culture, whereas I argue that an individual can choose from options defined by several cultures. As I see it, the issue of whether options defined by a single culture are interlocking options or options that come one by one doesn't quite affect this disagreement. For suppose Joseph is right about interlocking options and I am right about choice sets then an individual choosing what to do with her life would have to recognize that a choice of option A from culture number one, culture C1, is going to bring a whole lot of other C1 baggage with it. Right? You can't just neatly detach it from C1. It interlocks, and sometimes interlocks quite tightly with lots of other elements of C1. Whereas a choice of option B from culture C2 will bring with it a lot of C2 baggage uh, along with it. But still, he might choose from a set comprising A and B. And it need not be the case that A brings with it the whole of C1 and B brings with it the whole of C2, as though these were each Leibnizian monads reflective of their entire little worlds. There's no reason to buy into that sort of holism. But I do certainly acknowledge what Raz says, that A and B would be cultural fragments avulsively plucked from their cultural context, each trailing a ragged cluster of other cultural materials. And I believe that the menus from which people make their autonomous choices have exactly this disorderly and ragged feel to them. And if we had more time, I would defend the proposition that this is no bad thing. What I've just said is plausible on the assumption that autonomy for each individual involves just one major life-defining choice. What if it involves many choices? Joseph might argue that making many choices from a menu that comprises options from a variety, I know this talk of menu and options, is, it's, it's just a model, from a menu that comprises options from a variety of cultures risks incoherence if each option is connected to other aspects of the culture to which it belongs. One might end up choosing a religion from one culture and a career from another culture, and the career might make the religious practice very difficult, or the religion might frown on the career in ways that would not have been true had one chosen a career religion package from a single culture. And that's true too. And I think, again, it's no bad thing. A similar point is made by Joseph when he considers the coordination of one person's choice with those of others around him. I mean, I hope somehow in the midst of this argument I'm managing to convey, uh, as though it needed conveying, how rich and complicated and telling 
the, the, the account of autonomy, personal autonomy of individuals in social settings and institutional settings in the morality of freedom and elsewhere in Joseph's work is. And it really is a complicated theory, and it's that complicated theory that I'm attempting to get to grips with here. So now we're considering the relationship between the chooser and the social relationships, which may partly be the object of choice and may partly be the given environment of choice. When the menu of options for children, for example, differs substantially from the menu of options from which their parents made life choices, then there's going to be the sort of raggedness and things fitting ill together between people who need to be close to one another. The same sort of raggedness as I was talking about a moment ago between two different choices that I might have made in my own life. We might get interpersonal incoherence and the aspiration of every parent to, as Joseph puts it, understand their children, share their world, and remain close to them may be frustrated or undermined uh, in this context. So it may be important not just that an individual choose from a single culture, but since a culture is a social entity, choose from the same cultural array of options and the same, using the same set of cultural meanings to guide that choice as those with whom on any account the person has to remain close are choosing from. Again, I think that's important, but I come back to the point that I raised about 10 minutes ago, that we have to think about this credibly in the context of what modern, diverse, multicultural societies are actually like. I mean, you could imagine this sort of incoherence arising because what we're imagining is one encompassing group with a traditional culture, C1, living largely intact, undisturbed in the countryside, and in a distant metropolis, there's another more modern culture flourishing aggressively. And a person with a foot in both camps, or a couple or a family with split allegiances, may well face the difficulties that Raz mentions. And some of those difficulties may genuinely be uh, undermining of the importance of autonomy in the way that Raz argues. Migrating from the one milieu to the other may be very, very painful. And not, not as painful, but, but sort of autonomy compromising in some ways. And for these reasons, it might indeed be wise to protect the traditional culture in the countryside from serious depredation from the metropolis, maybe. But that picture doesn't really capture what we're talking about in modern multicultural circumstances, particularly in the countries in which cultural rights claims are actually put forward. What we see there are the, multi, are the remnants of various cultures up close against one another, living not only side by side, but overlapping our lives to the extent that cultures live lives, interacting with one another and with the more aggressive culture of modernity. Everyone willy-nilly is going to have a foot in both camps. And in this respect, the gap between parents and children, though real, is going to be at most one of degree rather than kind. To a large extent, the cultures not only abut upon one another, but permeate one another. The boundaries are indistinct. There is already considerable infiltration. And people now find their footing, so far as the exercise of autonomy is concerned, they have to find their footing in the melange of traditional and modern cultures. They can no longer proceed on the basis of traditional one cultural integrity, even if that were desirable. They no longer need that. It no longer makes much sense. It's no longer really available. The exercise of autonomy in this complicated setting, where the ragged remnants of different cultures are living life in the same social environment, the, the exercise of autonomy in this setting still requires socially defined and culturally defined options, but it doesn't require the options to be defined by a flourishing whole integrated culture, because there are none. It does not require an array of options whose integrity is underwritten by the coherence of the single culture of an encompassing group. That this is the case, I think, is undeniable. Is it a pity from the point of view either of culture or from the point of view of autonomy? I think it's a pity from neither point of view, to tell the truth. The sort of juxtaposition, confrontation, ragged choosing, intermingling, partial incoherence, melange of cultures that characterizes modern societies as healthy, 
its raggedness, its infiltrations, the indistinctness of boundaries to which it gives rise, all these are healthy. This is how cultures change and grow, and this is how individuals change and grow when ragged elements of one culture are brought into relation with the ragged remnants of another in the real lives of complicated, hesitant, ambivalent flesh and blood men and women. I think the tensions and the incongruities and the hurt feelings and misunderstandings between dad and children, miserable though they are, this sounds so silly, are sources of growth and creativity for the individuals concerned. But I actually do believe they are sources of growth and creativity for the individuals concerned. They certainly form a basis on which an individual can really be him or herself in a way that the ideal of autonomy recommends, as opposed to some sort of figure in a diorama model of a culture preserved in the Museum of Natural History or the Museum of Mankind or something like that. Now, I'm almost done. Somebody, not necessarily Joseph, may respond that, well, you know, this is all very well, but all I've done is describe a new culture, C1 plus 2, which flourishes in New York City or whatever. Uh, Will Kimlicker said something like that in response to my attempt in an earlier paper to describe the various culturally diverse elements in my own identity. He said, probably almost certainly correct in the first sentence, I think Waldron is seriously overstating the case here. For one thing, he vastly overestimates the extent to which people do in fact move between cultures because he assumes that cultures are based on ethnic descent. On his view, an Irish American who eats Chinese food and reads her child Grimm's fairy tales is thereby living in a kaleidoscope of cultures but this is not moving between societal cultures, rather this is enjoying the opportunities provided by the diverse societal culture which characterizes the Anglophone society of the United States. So then in, in, in that passage, I think Will Kimlicken is using a much more loosely defined notion of culture than I have assumed is the case with Joseph's notion of a particular culture or the culture of a particular encompassing group. Kimlicker's notion is more capacious in the sense of leaving ample room for elements, including options, of diverse provenance and for the expression of a variety of particular ethnic or religious identities under the one cultural roof. Obviously, at some point, the cost of this capaciousness is going to be to trivialize the importance of the claim that single particular cultures are crucial for individual autonomy. If we insist that the options in a given array, options which are in fact available, that is, they could be chosen by a person, are all part of the same culture simply on the ground that they are available to that person and people like him, then we trivialize, I think, the individuation of cultures beyond any theoretical interest. Then the argument would simply be we must make sure that whatever array of options there is, is an array in good shape, and we would have lost our grip on the notion of defending traditional cultural forms on their own terms. Any array of materials would count as part of a single culture whenever they were familiar to one and the same person or one and the same group of persons. Now that's fine by me, because triviality is the first step towards dismissal, and I think in the end the individuation of cultures as distinct entities can and ought to be dissolved in this way. But then it's not clear what would become of the rest of Joseph's argument about the importance to individuals of the prosperity of their own cultures being maintained. Their culture is now simply the multicultural milieu in which they find themselves, and its prosperity is more or less assumed as given. So that's it. Um, what I've done, I hope, is tried to identify two mistakes about culture and autonomy. One is the proposition that culturally defined options have value because choice has value. The other is the proposition that whole cultures have value because culturally defined options have value. These propositions involve something like two opposite uses of the fallacy of composition. The first says that because alpha, which is a whole, has value, therefore beta, which is a part of it, has value. And the second argument says that because beta has value, then another whole, gamma, of which beta is also a part, another whole gamma, like a culture, uh, 
uh, also has value. Putting the two points together, it appears that we can move from the value of alpha, individual autonomy, to the value of gamma, a particular culture, via the common connection to the idea of beta, which is a culturally defined option. But I wanted to, to, to ask us to consider the possibility that the move is illegitimate. A particular culturally defined option does not acquire any of the value connected to autonomous choice just by being available for autonomous choice. It may have its own value, to which of course autonomous choice responds, but that is not the same as saying that value is conferred on it by its simple presence in the context of autonomous choice. And the second argument was like unto it and said, whatever importance the option has by virtue of its presence in the context of choice does not depend on its being and remaining part of whatever culture gave it its inherent meaning. The option may be important as an object of choice by virtue of what it is, and what it is may be partly or wholly determined from the culture from which it sprang, but it certainly doesn't follow that therefore the culture from which it sprang has value or indeed that it has anything more than genealogical importance for the context in which autonomy uh, is exercised. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Professor Tuckness. Jeremy Waldron's very interesting paper examines the adequacy of Raz's argument connecting the value of autonomy with claims for self-determination and multicultural accommodation. Now, it's important to note at the outset that Waldron has limited his discussion to autonomy-based arguments. So this leaves open the possible alternative defense of national determination and multicultural accommodation, namely that such policies are desirable because they improve human well-being, even if the improvement in well-being cannot be directly traced to their contribution to autonomy. And in fact, in the, both the morality of freedom as well as in uh, the later essays, the argument is presented where autonomy is one but not the only argument in favor of uh, multicultural accommodation. So therefore, there may be other reasons why multiculturalism might be a good thing. If someone's uh, culture with which their identity is closely tied up is being ridiculed, their life might go uh, more poorly. Uh, sameness of culture may facilitate the ease with which one can take advantage of particular options, and so that might be a reason to, to facilitate it. And both of those are at least somewhat distinct uh, from the autonomy-based argument that Waldron is, is uh, focusing on today. Um, given that, um, what I want to do is to focus on the specifics of Waldron's account and particularly how he tries to, to look at the connection between autonomy and culture. The first half of Waldron's paper uh, focuses on what he calls the formal objection. Uh, Raz wrote in The Morality of Freedom that things are constituent goods if they are elements of what is good in itself which contribute to its value, i.e., elements for which a situation which is good in itself would be less valuable. Now, Waldron wants to make a general as opposed to a specific objection to this claim. It's not just with respect to autonomy, it's with respect to the whole concept of constituent goods that he makes his objection. He says that something's being a constituent part of a complex good does not make the thing itself good, and he gives us the example of a barrister. It may be true that the presence of disputes requiring litigation is a constituent part of the life of a barrister being a valuable one, but that does not make the disputes themselves valuable. Well, I think Waldron is right that the life of a barrister would indeed be much less valuable given a conflict-free, harmonious world. Waldron thinks Raz's argument can be reformulated without the concept of constituent goods, and I, indeed I, I agree with that. But I think that Waldron's argument here moves a little bit too quickly and that the notion of constituent goods may still be a useful concept if we understand the purpose it's playing in the argument a little bit differently. So think about a couple of different ways uh, we might use the concept of constituent goods. We might ask, is X a constituent good of intrinsic good Y given condition Z for different reasons? We might want to know, for example, whether a given option X contributes to autonomy under condition Z because we want to make a statement about how valuable X is as such. Now, if this is the upshot of Raz's argument, then I think it falls, uh, falls to the objections that uh, Waldron was just raising. Waldron and Moore are right that something bad in itself might be a constituent part of a complex whole and somehow contribute to the whole 
of the complex good. But as I read uh, the point about constituent goods and morality of freedom, I understood it to be making a different point. One might instead want to know, is X a constituent good of Y, given condition Z, to aid in the process of practical reasoning? So suppose a choice must be made that potentially involves eliminating option X. If its elimination will greatly diminish the value of Y, that gives us a defeasible reason to retain it. Or if we change from condition Z1 to Z2, and that means that removing X is no longer going to substantially decrease the value of Y, we'd want to know that as well. Thus, for example, if a magic potion were discovered that would cause the entire world to live in harmony if released into the atmosphere, and a person was trying to decide whether or not to release it, he would be better understood if he knew that doing his actions would likely make the lives of barristers much less valuable. I also suspect the lives of therapists, police officers, and arms makers would all be adversely affected by such a development. All of these would be reasons relevant to the exercise of practical reason, but they're obviously defeasible reasons. Now, indeed, I think the upshot of Moore's argument is actually supportive rather than hostile to the Raz's larger project. I think Raz and Moore both agree that the value of a whole is not necessarily the same as the value of its parts. And thus, whenever we engage in practical reasoning about whether to perform an action that will change an organic whole, both Raz and Moore would say that we should carefully assess how changing one element of the whole will affect the value of the whole. Thus, a particular option that seems unimportant in and of itself might turn out to be particularly valuable if its absence meant that a person's autonomy was significantly compromised. Thus, if we focus on questions of practical reason, reasoning about actions that might either change or preserve a given state of affairs, then Moore would, in principle, recognize the possibility that a given option might contribute to an important value such as autonomy, such that were the option removed, the value of the autonomy would substantially decrease. Now, all of this, however, seems to me a prelude to what I take to really be the main argument of the paper, which is the substantive relationship between culture and autonomy. Now, I think there's two different arguments we might understand Waldron to be making uh, in his presentation today. The first one I'm going to call the necessary condition argument, or NC. The necessary condition argument states that the presence of a variety of options embedded within a single culture is not a necessary condition for autonomy because all that is required is that there be some culture, not a particular one. Now, alternatively, Waldron might mean to grant that in cases where cultures are very alien, the presence of a valuable option from one's own culture is a necessary condition for autonomy. So, instead of claiming in C, he might be claiming that the conditions necessary to falsify in C happen very rarely because what we experience in practice is a cultural melange. And so I'm going to call this argument CM. CM would state that it is rarely, if ever, the case that there is so little overlap between cultures that the options offered by a strange culture are insufficient for autonomy because what we experience in practice is a melange of different cultures. So in other words, CM is going to claim that the remnants of other cultures in such a context are not so strange to us that they fail to qualify as valuable options. Now with respect to NC, the necessary condition argument, Waldron says in his paper at one point that it is not essential for autonomy that people choose among options defined by a single culture. A little bit later, he says that options defined by a single culture are not indispensable for meaningful choice. This seems to me the language of, of necessary conditions. Now, again here, I think we can draw a distinction between a stronger and weaker version of the necessary condition argument. The strong version would hold that having choices from one's own culture is never a necessary condition for autonomy so long as a person has access to some culture or combination of cultures. The weak version of NC would hold that there are some people who can manage to be autonomous without choosing options from a single culture. So for the weaker claim, all you'd have to do is show one person who's able to live an autonomous life crossing over between cultures, and you show that it's not necessary that a person's uh, options be defined uh, solely by one culture. Now, I think the weak version is almost certainly true. Uh, there are many people who manage to move between cultures and live autonomous lives. But I also think the weak version is fairly uninteresting. If there are some people for whom options from within their own culture are it's necessary for their autonomy, then this would provide a reason for preserving the cult cultural opportunities for those particular people. So let's instead examine the strong version. 
In the strong version of NC, we may help ourselves to the easier cases where cultures are clearly identified non-overlapping cultural groups. Consider an Amish teenager trying to decide whether to be a farmer within the community, let's assume that's the only occupational option available to him there, or leaving the community to continue his education and pursue a career in New York City where he can choose from a thousand different professions. And let's also assume that he knows enough about the outside world to know the vast array of occupational choices that are available to him outside and that he has the necessary resources to pursue either option. How many valuable options are available to him and do they constitute an acceptable set? Well, from one perspective, there are really only two choices at this juncture that really matter, the choice to leave and the choice to stay. From this perspective, if the Amish community in which our character lives is crumbling to the point of disbanding, his autonomy is greatly compromised because where once there were two viable options, now there's only one. Now, from a second perspective, the teenager has an enormous number of choices, as many as New York has to offer. From this second perspective, the loss of one option does not measurably affect his autonomy because he still has a huge array of other options to choose from. 1,001 is not importantly different from 1,000. If someone has a choice among being a defense attorney, a patent attorney, or a tax attorney, does the presence of this variety increase his autonomy? Well, I think the interesting possibility here is that it's different for different people. For those who are inclined to the legal profession, the choice of a particular specialization may be an important expression of their autonomy, while someone not so inclined may be puzzled to even understand what the difference between the specializations is. While a person's subjective assessment of such things might be wrong, the ultimate criteria of worth is how much the presence of the options contributes to a person's well-being, and clearly for many people, the presence of these specializations isn't going to add very much. Thus, while for some people the melange of options offered by New York would constitute a perfectly acceptable set of options, it might not for another person if his own culture was sufficiently different or if he were simply the sort of person who had a much more difficult time crossing between cultures. If the Amish example is unpersuasive, we could imagine a more extreme case where teenagers from a secluded tribe in a distant continent were kidnapped and dropped in New York City. And we can imagine well-meaning kidnappers who provide the children with much higher material standards of living than they experienced before, but we might still ask whether their ability to lead autonomous lives would be seriously undermined by such a displacement. So if both of these cases, in both of these cases, the decrease in autonomy would be a matter of degree. The Amish teenager still has some capacity for autonomy in the same way that a religious dissenter in John Locke's day retained autonomy insofar as he could risk the confiscation of his property by attending a disfavored church. So in other words, the fact that it's Hard to exercise an option doesn't mean there's no autonomy, but on Raz's account, it would mean uh, the value of autonomy has been decreased. It's a matter of degree. Now, the fact that Raz's account uh, makes autonomy a matter of degree raises an even deeper question about this whole line of analysis. We've assumed to this point that in asking about the necessary conditions for autonomy, we're asking the right questions. But I think this focus may be misplaced. I think sometimes in philosophy, there's a tendency to have a bit of a fetish when it comes to necessary and sufficient conditions for things. So one could show triumphantly that the presence of a wide variety of options from one's own culture is neither necessary nor sufficient for an autonomous life without realizing that the presence of such options might still substantially increase autonomy in a large number of cases that, given other conditions, are likely to be present. Thus, if we return to the question of practical reason and ask instead, whether concerns over autonomy might provide an important reason for enacting or not enacting a given policy, knowing the necessary and sufficient conditions for autonomy is not enough. And I think here Waldron is to be commended for talking about what it looks like on the ground. What does it look like in practice? What does the typical case look like? Uh, since as a matter of uh, policy, this is going to be the more important question. So this leads to the second uh, claim, CM. Uh, CM is not a statement about necessary or sufficient conditions. It's about what is likely to happen in practice. And I think what Waldron wants to say is that situations like the one I was describing with the Amish teenager are very rare. That what we actually experience uh, more commonly is this ragged mixture of cultures that we, all, that we all swim in. Now, the first thing to note here is that there are, I think, still important cases where the more extreme picture might be true. And if it seems less true to Waldron in Western society, we could think about, say, Kurdish or Chechenian nationalists who are pressing claims for 
uh, national self-determination, in those cases, uh, the degree of otherness between the two cultures might be quite a bit higher, uh, and therefore their ability to experience foreign <laughs> cultural options as valuable might be, uh, might be substantially different. When Raz makes the argument for national self-determination, it is premised on the assumption that groups meet his six-fold criteria of what an encompassing group actually is. And so if Waldron is right, uh, one way of understanding it would be that as time progresses and the culture of uh, the dominant culture of the West continues to expand, there are going to be fewer and fewer groups that meet the standard of encompassing groups. And so there are going to be fewer and fewer groups that are going to actually be able to help themselves to Raz's argument in practice. Now, this conceptual point uh, that I think Waldron is right about is less important than the truth of the substantive claim, which is, what does it really look like on the ground? What do people actually experience? And so here I think the exchange between Waldron and Kimlicka is enlightening. Kimlicka claims that Waldron, what Waldron calls a typical melange, is actually just someone who's comfortable with Western Anglophone culture. Waldron's response is that this stretches the notion of culture to mean any set of options that are available to a given set of people, even if those options descend from a variety of ethnic and religious traditions. Now, I don't think Kimlicka's argument convinced him to saying that. I think much rides here on how we spell out the notion of available. What does it mean to say an option is available to someone? If available means only that it is conceptually possible for a person to pursue a given option, then I think Waldron's right that the notion of a culture is being stretched to the point of absurdity. On the other hand, if we took available to mean that the option, is question, the option in question is one that the person is able to pursue without damaging his sense of identity, then the argument makes more sense. Both the Amish teenager and myself as a teenager had the option of being an attorney in New York available to us in the first loose sense. But if the Amish teenager feels that following that path would compromise his identity, well, I felt no such uh, feelings then there might be a very real sense in which the option of being an attorney in New York is more available to me than it is to the Amish teenager. Within the Amish community, different teenagers might have different capacities for pursuing lives outside the community. To take a less extreme example, we could imagine uh, a bilingual Quebecois amidst a crumbling Francophone society. One can say that the options afforded by the Anglophone culture are not available to him in the same way that they are available to someone from Saskatoon. The dominant Anglophone culture of North America includes an astonishing array of subcultures. The fact that they are subcultures and not cultures, it could be argued, is evidenced precisely by the relative ease with which people can move between them without compromising their sense of identity. But where people cannot move so easily, we have reason to suspect that there is a difference in culture that substantially affects whether a given person reasonably regards a given option as valuable, a valuable one for him. So in conclusion, notice that this way of responding to Waldron relies on fusing two distinct arguments. One is the notion that multicultural accommodation and national self-determination are desirable because they promote autonomy. The second is that these policies promote well-being by preserving options that are particularly valuable to certain people because of the ease which with, with which they can pursue them and the consistency of those pursuits with their given identity. Now, this, I think, is a characteristically Razian position. Since he believes that autonomy depends on having an acceptable range of valuable options, then we must ask how valuable a given set of options is to a particular person to assess his capacity for autonomy. This, it seems to me, would point us to some key areas for discussion. First, is it true that whether a given set of options is valuable for a particular person may vary widely based on that person's previous background and capability for pursuing cross-cultural cross projects in a way that contributes to well-being. In the same way that Roz claims that whether a person has an obligation to obey the law varies from person to person as well as from law to law, so perhaps whether the set of options available is acceptable or not could vary radically from person to person. Which leads us to a second point, which is what exactly constitutes the threshold of acceptability? Well, it may be right to say that where there are no valuable options to pursue or only one, a person cannot be autonomous, there must come a point where adding additional options that particular people find value, valuable is best understood uh, as just doing so so that their lives will go better and not because they will lack autonomy without it. And I think this is important for assessing when the reasons for providing these op 
options might actually constitute a right, which again, as a question of practical reason, is what generates these as lively debates in the first place. Thanks, Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy and uh, Alex. Uh, Jeremy, let me uh, ask whether you want to say a word, uh, in res anything in response to Alex, yeah, and then we'll just, open the floor for a general just discussion. A, just a few words. I, I very much appreciated those um, comments. Um, I think it was particularly important that Alex insisted that we approach these matters uh, in a way that does not tie itself up with particular formulations. Uh, the point about necessary and sufficient conditions was very, very well taken indeed. And, and I do think it's important also to grapple um, with the issues uh, in the, um, the, the complicated way in which he poses them, often sort of nested structures of choice, that you don't really get to choose whether to be a patent attorney or a uh, criminal litigator before you've already decided to leave mom and dad back at the, at the, uh, the farm. Um, and we could debate the particular cases. I don't think it's particularly profitable to do so just in the two or three minutes that I should take right now. I um, did want to say, I think, three, four things. First of all, entirely accept that other strong arguments were presented for national self-determination and cultural accommodation um, in Joseph's essays and elsewhere which are not affected by this particular argument about culture and autonomy. That's, that's right. I think in the end on the um, constituent good stuff, the, the crucial thing is the role and practical reasoning. And as I said halfway through the paper when I switched from the, from the, uh, the Morian discussion to the substantive discussion, the, the, the practical connections remain intact. We can still talk about the reasons there are for retaining X uh, without having to attribute implausibly value to X. In New Zealand, when they abolished tort law, I suppose they did have to consider the effect this would have on the choice sets facing uh, new lawyers, not to mention old lawyers, and one has to think about that very, very carefully. Um, I think actually along the complicated lines that Alex and Joseph in different ways have indicated, but it would certainly be silly to think about it simply in terms of, well, we're taking away something of value since the existence of tort litigation has been an indisputable part of the autonomous choices that people have chosen to be uh, civil litigators. Uh, a much more sensitive account than that is necessary. What I mostly wanted to do was to say just a little bit about um, the plausibility of the extreme cases that Alex was talking about not the cases of uh, ragged remnants of cultures butting up against one another in an urban environment, but the cases of um, cultures really being quite radically distinct from one another in a way that would really leave people stranded uh, between quite, not only quite incommensurable choices, but what for them were not experienced as choices at all. I think there are three, four points to make about these extreme cases. The first is we must be careful not to exaggerate the strangeness of cultures to one another. In the uh, multiculturalism industry, we often assume that what's most important about a given culture is what's most distinctive about it. But there's no reason why those two should line up. So somebody living, I don't know, in the Philippines, and somebody living in Guatemala and somebody uh, living in the north of England. The most important thing about their cultural life may be, for all I know, their Roman Catholicism, something that they share with each of the others. And the things that a grade school teacher would use to highlight the distinctiveness of Yorkshire, Guatemala, and uh, the Philippines, you know, the colorful national costumes, the songs, the drinking contests, and, 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 and so on, may loom rather less large. I mean, these cultures, cultures exist in the world, and many of them are partly constituted by cosmopolitan elements, whether we like it or not. And I take it that the existence of a global church, whether it's Islam uh, or the, uh, the Catholic Church, for example, is a cosmopolitan element in a variety of distinct cultures, and we must not exaggerate the strangeness 
simply as we would if we had some other interest in distinctiveness as such. Secondly, when we talk about culture these days in these contexts, we are supposed to be talking about what used to be called low culture, which means we mustn't uh, downplay the element of material um, uh, culture. And the, 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 the fact that there is a television set here uh, and that, therefore, in that sense, it's, it's not utterly distinct from somewhere else where there's a television set or a satellite dish or an automobile uh, and so on. We tend, again, from the sort of grade school teacher perspective, to want to highlight those things which, are, which, which as it were, are not mundane, not the Coca-Cola cans, not the automobiles. But people must take responsibility for the world in which we share um, material culture. And I think choices that people make to preserve or to maintain defiantly the separateness of cultures need to be understood and evaluated against those claims. Thirdly, in the, in the case that was most interesting of the, the, the several cases that Alex presented, the Amish teenager, we can't just understand the Amish situation or some situations like the Amish as simply being, here's a culture that has been left high and dry by the hegemony of... of uh, other dominant cultures. It's rather, here is a community of people who have deliberately adopted a certain stance with regard to the cultures that in fact abut upon them and have deliberately cultivated a certain stance, possibly for very good reasons, possibly for reasons of keeping faith with traditions when that stance was much more urgently necessary than it is now, but the stance has been cultivated. The stance is not, not just one of the culture, here it is and look what mean things we have, we have done. And so anything we say about the choices that would face somebody choosing whether to leave or stay are choices about whether to continue to adopt and participate in this particular defiant stance. Though we live in the modern world, we will not be of it, um, that view. And this doesn't undercut anything that Alex said. This is said in the, in the spirit of his own uh, very um, uh, nuanced presentation of how to think about these options. But finally, I think among all the sorts of reasons which might make a certain option seem unattractive to a person, many of those reasons are reasons, as we say, of identification. Sometimes they are reasons of conviction. Sometimes they are, you know, whether it's religious conviction or, or, or some other, sometimes those are reasons of, um, of the best thinking that one has been able to do. I don't want to become a CIA operative, and so that option is not available to me. I don't want to adopt a career where I can't practice my religion, and so um, uh, that option is unavailable to me. And I mean, I respect, and I think we have to leave a place for those conviction elements in uh, the politics of cultural identity. But the trouble with talking about identity and identification is that it blurs some distinction which at some level might be worth hanging on to, though not in a, in a mindless way, the distinction between background and conviction. The notion of identification, I believe, deliberately tries to blur that. It deliberately tries to blur the notion of, here I stand, I can do no other, because this ultimately is what I believe, and here I stand, I can do no other, because of how I was brought up, or something like that. And although those two are going to be entangled with each other, I think it is worth um, making some difference between them. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Before opening it uh, to general questions, can I just uh, uh, ask you both for a moment to talk about uh, another point that uh, Alex raised, which I found very interesting, and this is the question of the ab availability of uh, cultures to people uh, who uh, don't come from the culture or aren't part of the culture to, be, uh, to begin with. If we can take the case of this Amish teenager uh, on the one side and the case of, uh, say, a typical Princeton or Columbia or NYU student from Greenwich uh, on the uh, other. Uh, st student A, we might very well say the Amish student, or the Amish teenager, uh, doesn't seem to have the options available to student B available to him. But wouldn't we also say that at least one crucial option, that is the option of actually being part of the Amish community, isn't available to student B. Now, if that's the case, if I'm right about that, if, if, if that, the, the discussion of availability can get us that far, 
Does that mean that uh, student, uh, students, uh, student B is actually no more autonomous, at least in respect of that dimension of autonomy, uh, than student A? Uh, or if student B, the Greenwich student, uh, is more autonomous or has more richly available to him the value of autonomy, um, is that anything we should worry very much about when it comes to teenager A? Uh, would we say that teenagers A, teenager A's life, the Amish students, the Amish teenager's life is less rich or somehow less valuable or less to be said for it than, than B. Alex, do you want to begin and then perhaps Jeremy can say one? Sure. I think, I think one thing to say is that because of the, the nesting of the way that choices are going to work there, um, what, what seems crucial is the number, is whether the person has a sufficient set of valuable options to choose from. Okay? And so, uh, if, if you sort of imagine a, a kind of tree where uh, there's already been a divergence, right? The, the Amish student is sort of on one branch of the tree and the, the teenager from uh, Greenwich is on the other. In terms of where they can go next, the number of options still may be very different. In other words, when, when you talk to the teenager from Greenwich and say, what are you thinking about being? What do you want? They may be able to rattle off a thousand possibilities of things uh, they might want to be. Now, being an Amish farmer may not be one of those on the list, right? So it's, it's true that there are some options that having already gone that far down the path have sort of closed off, but it doesn't mean that each of them has an equivalent number of options that are available. Okay, Jeremy? I think that's right. There's no guarantee of symmetry mm -hmm. uh, here necessarily. That's the first point. Um, the second point, and um, this is stuff that I learned from Joseph before I learned it from Alex, but I've learned it from Alex again today. <laughs> We're going to be really, really careful not to talk about these matters in too flippant a way. I'm not sure that we want to talk about availability as some sort of metric of ease. Um, uh, there are some ways where people's lives go a certain way. Yes, I believe, weirdly, my own might be an example. You know, it just sort of I don't remember ever choosing whether to go into this line of business. It was just the easy thing to do at each stage. And I mean, I could have been a lawyer or a fireman as I wanted to be when I was a young kid, but, but and there's going to be some, some forms of easily drifting into one way of life or another which, which actually will uh, uh, raise, seriously raise the question whether this was autonomous choice at all, whether this person had genuinely taken responsibility for her, for her choice. One of the things that dominates, I think, a large part of uh, the last chunk of the morality of freedom is an insistence that the question in the form in which we've been necessarily discussing it because we needed straightforward models is not always the best form in which to pose questions about autonomy. A person's life has gone in one way rather than another. And the question is not whether there was ever a menu of choices uh, among which that person chose, but there was a question nevertheless about what role did reflection and choice and judgment play in the fact that a person's life went or continued to go in one way or another. And if the role that reflection and choice played was something like, well, I could have done that, and I sort of considered it on a number of occasions, but it would have been way too hard, I suppose that's an autonomous judgment of a certain sort, and autonomy can be contributed. It may be the subject of criticism as an autonomous judgment because the question of the hardness and difficulty should not have loomed so large given the difference of value between these two ways of, of life. So just for those reasons, I think um, very, very important not to, um, not to uh, uh, give a too simple a notion of um, the metric of availability uh, in this case. What would you say to the proposition that um what matters is not that people have available to them uh, a lot of possible choices or life paths or life plans, but that 
the culture in which they find themselves make available to them the resources for living a worthy, a rich, uh, satisfying, a productive life. And if someone asserting that proposition might point to the Amish without idealizing them, which of course we do tend to do, but nevertheless might look to the Amish and say, well, look, uh, someone raised in an Amish community does not have available to him very many choices effectively. In fact, by stopping education at a fairly uh, young uh, age, uh, the, the effective uh, options are really quite limited for leaving the community. But nevertheless, the community does make available to all of its children uh, an opportunity for living a, an upright, worthy, many ways rich, and productive, valuable life, a life worth living. And so autonom autonomy just isn't important in the picture of, I, on I, that proposition. I think that's probably right. There's, a, there's a, an argument in the morality of freedom that autonomy becomes important because societies of various sorts have shaped themselves in a certain way. And uh, envir in environments that support autonomy, autonomy does become important. And one cannot necessarily infer from that that autonomy has been important for all time and uh, for the human being as such. In the society in which I inhabit, one's life is permeated with giving an account of oneself to others. I'm sorry. Uh, in, in, the, in the forms of life I inhabit, we constantly give an account of oneself to others, and we constantly go back to uh, talk about choices and fake choices we face and so on. And the culture we inhabit is riddled with the language of autonomy. Um, and uh, if you, as it were, can't give an account of yourself in those terms, you're kind of high and dry. <laughs> yeah. Other cultures may organize themselves on a different basis. And look, the amount I know about the Amish way of life could be written on a postage stamp. But, um, I can imagine that people walking around um, in the communities that we have in mind here under the heading of Amish and constantly yeah. asking, well, what was deeply behind? What sort of decision of value did you make when you decided to be this or that within the Amish community? Wasn't a question that uh, seemed very important to a lot of people. And so we have to ask ourselves about the circumstances in which autonomy becomes an important value and one of the things I tried to do, I don't think I brought this out well enough in the paper, was to try and connect the real life circumstances where autonomy is likely to be an issue with whatever it is that we say about cultures and the importance of cultures for autonomy. I'm not saying that autonomy is important in the circumstances where it's not an issue, which is where some of the most extreme cases of culture and cultural dissonance come up. Yeah. Alex, anything on that? I mean, I think the the interesting possibility your, your question raises is if we're looking at what contributes to well-being, is it possible that what's important about autonomy is autonomy is actually instrumental to arriving in a situation where a person is able to sort of endorse their life projects? So by, by endorsement, it means uh, they identify with the projects that they pursue. They see the worth and the value of those projects. Uh, and it may turn out that for their well-being, it isn't as important uh, how big a menu of choices they had so much as whether whichever path they end up going down is one that they really believe in the worth in they identify themselves with, right? And so uh, the possibility of the Amish teenager, I think, brings that out quite nicely because uh, if he really believes in the value of the life he's living, he sees the different goods he's engaged in as being worthy of, of his attention and pursuit, uh, his well-being might be quite a bit higher than someone who had a much much wider variety of options, but either chose to devote himself to options that weren't very valuable or uh, never was able to really endorse any of the things, even if valuable, that he, he pursued. Well, uh, we're going to now open the uh, floor for discussion, but we have a procedural uh, and technical problem. Uh, and, and that is that we're uh, recording uh, today's uh, deliberations up until the last panel. Uh, and to facilitate questions getting on to the record, uh, we have to invite people up to the microphone. Now, that strikes me as a conversation killer. We have no portable microphone. We don't, evidently don't have a portable microphone, and I apologize for that. I did not anticipate the, uh, the, uh, the problem. And we really do want this to be a discussion. I mean, we want to run this to the extent possible like a seminar and not just a Q&A. 
Q&A. I think all the uh, participants would join me in appreciating uh, running things uh, that way. So I'm going to ask our technical, ah, our technical man has a solution. As long as we don't get too far into the group, we can actually move it and walk around it. Excellent. We're just looking not to get feedback. Oh, so okay. Somebody wants Br to Brad, can you, can you man the, uh, yeah. That's terrific. Thank you very much. That'll, I think, really facilitate the kind of conversation uh, we want to have. Well, I can already see that, that we're, we're going to have a live livelihood just by all the hands in the air. Let me begin with Professor Harmon. <laughs> All right, um, Jeremy, I want to ask about your arg Oh, did I knock over my soda? Awesome. Um, Jeremy, I want to ask about the argument in the first half of the paper. So I, um, I think that you successfully argue for your claim that it's not always the case that if something is a constituent part of something of value, that the constituent part has value. And I, I like your arguments by counterexample. But you also gave another argument that I, that I think doesn't work. And that argument was, um, let's look in particular at a choice. And we think a choice has value. And then we might think, because the choice has value, this option has value. But that's really, that's a weird thing to say. Suppose that's the less good option. And then the person is trying to decide what to do. It's, that person is trying to take all of the ways that the options are valuable into account. But surely, they're not taking into account that it's that that the value that the option gets in virtue of being part of the choice situation that's just weird and i guess i want to i think that that argument is equivocating so the claim that you want to dispute is the claim that it's valuable that you have the option because the choice is valuable that's really in a way what you want to dispute but that i it, it could well be that it's valuable that I have the option. That doesn't at all tell in favor of taking the option, because it doesn't suggest that taking the option would be valuable. So it seems utterly consistent to say it's valuable that I have the option because the choice is valuable. Nevertheless, when I'm deciding what to do, that value is irrelevant, because it's not, it doesn't mean it's valuable to take the option. Yeah. Now, that sounds right. Um, and um, my immediate inclination is just to accept it and therefore abandon that part of the argument. Won't quite do, um, because if it's valuable that I have the option, then the existence of the option, excuse me, the existence of the thing that I have as an option is a constituent of that, and therefore the existence of the thing is of value. And we don't want to say that for the reasons that I've given that it would distract us from, I mean, there may be other reasons that the distraction is minimal anyway, because this is going to be a wash. Uh, everything that can be said about the constituent value of option A can be said about constituent value of option B, so it cancels out, and one wouldn't be distracted from it anyway. I think it is certainly the case that when one emphasizes that what's important is that I have the option, then that pertains to a um, practical reasoning about something which is different from the, the actual practical question that I face when I make my decision. And I think that point is very important and I acknowledge it. And I think that's taken care of. That is, that point is still respected. Um, when we move to talk about, well, what does autonomy require uh, without getting distracted by this notion of constituent good? So here, here's what vestige of my concern survives this perfectly reasonable observation. When we talk about uh, the value of constituent goods, which is a form of intrinsic value in the schema that Joseph set out, it looks as though it's intrinsic value of the item itself rather than intrinsic value of this particular, of one's having this option. And uh, that seems to be a problem. It's going to be a problem that we either get to the short way round that I took inappropriately in the paper, or I think the long way round that I've, I, I worry about would flow even from your formulation. If we can drop the, long, the language of constituent value in hearing in the cultural form itself, and just talk about its importance for the context of choice that a person have it, then I think we um, can proceed more, more, uh, um, more appropriately on that basis. 
Professor George had to step out for a, a few minutes and asked me to stand in for him. Unfortunately, I can't be at two places at once, so if you could uh, pass that microphone. Uh, Professor Kay Teb in the, in the back. Not too far. <laughs> Uh, I find, <coughs> excuse me, I find discussion of the concept <coughs> of autonomy a little uh, narrow, shall I say. When I think of autonomy, I do not think of a menu of choices or even a, of a range of options. I think instead of the spirit of the political thought or philosophical thought of Mill and Nietzsche, I assume autonomy is felt when one is saying first, before saying yes to something, one is saying no. And that autonomy is memorably begun and perhaps even consummated by dissent, departure, rejection, the interruption of the arc of one's life, uh, and by comparable phenomena including conversion, departure, emigration. All these are versions of turning your back on something, saying no to something, refusing something, refusing to comply with something, <coughs> rejecting ease, um, and uh, feeling that one is truly autonomous, one has taken possession of one's life when one is embarking on some kind of adventure preceded by an, an emphatic <coughs> rejection. I wonder what our commentators would say about that. What do I do with this now? I, I would certainly uh, love to respond to that. Um, All the way through writing and reading this paper, I was uncomfortable with the language of a simple a menu of options and a choice um, from the menu. Um, I think, as I said in my comments a moment ago, that's not exactly how RAS sets it up. It certainly isn't how it should be set up. Um, to be autonomous is to turn one's back on certain forms of determination of one's living and to <laughs> insist like a heretic on certain forms of reflection, to insist on thinking for oneself, reflecting for oneself upon um, uh, one's own life and how it will go. And phenomenologically and morally, to think of that as running one's finger down a range of options and say, oh, well, I'll choose that one. That's not what's, what's important. It's the grappling with the issues of value uh, and principle that are involved when one is uh, tempted or finds oneself drifting into a certain way of life to stop short, turn one's back on the drift, turn one's back on the uh, letting the rest of the world choose one's path and uh, insisting on there being space for reflection and judgment, which may come at any time in the course of one's adoption of an option, to use this language. So, you know, most of us are born most of us, this is no longer true. Many of us are brought up in a religion long before we acquire the capacity to seriously reflect on the, on the, on the nature of the religion. But the autonomous person is the person who at some stage, even if he continues with the religion, nevertheless does so reflectively. So there is something very odd about talking about culturally determined forms as defining autonomous options. Um, because, I mean, it's, it's odd, it's not impossible. And as talking about choices among culturally determined forms as defining options, when the whole notion of autonomy is partly hostile to, or, or deliberately uncomfortable with culturally determined anything, or uh, 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 wholly determined anything. And maybe while all that's determined is the options, but not the choice between them. That's not actually how culture normally works, and it's certainly not how culture is going to work if we insist that the options have to be seen in the whole context, 
of the determination and the determining features of a way of life as they are if we pursue the single culture option. So what George has said says more eloquently and, and, and uh, um, um, clearly um, one of the things that, that really makes me feel uneasy about associating cultural forms with autonomy in this way. But I also take the broader point, which is critical of the way that I presented it. Alex had no choice. He had to respond to the way that I presented it, but the way I presented it in terms of menus and uh, arrays of options and, and so on. Uh, yes, right, right next to you, George. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I was able to follow the logic, and I was even able to follow the algebra. But the problem I have with algebra is that sometimes you get all the way down to the bottom of the calculation, and you find there's a gotcha, like, uh, therefore, the electron cannot exist, or therefore, there can't be a stable solar system. And usually, the reason for that is because you did a sloppy job in defining the uh, domain of the variables. Now, most of the discussion has been around a domain that's personal, the, the, uh, the decision of the Amish lad, etc. I can't help but wonder the think, though, that there isn't an aspect of this that relates to public policy. Uh, and, and I would find it very useful if you could just do a little bit of uh, particularizing the general topic to its implications, not just for the individual as he makes life choices, but for the society as it makes political choices. Um, I think that part of the reason the, the discussion had that flavor to it is uh, that, that both of us are being influenced by, by Roz, who says when we ask these questions about public policy, the ultimate criterion is going to be how are the lives of individual people either going to go better or worse as a result of advocating any given policy. So, so, so building on his perspective, if you want to be able to answer the larger public policy question, uh, you have to first begin by asking how would individual lives go better or worse, and then uh, proceed from there to ask what, what type of policy makes the best sense. And so I think the upshot in terms of public policy is going to depend a lot on how accurate uh, Waldron's picture is of the degree of overlap there is between cultures. Uh, the more porous and intermingled cultures are, uh, I think he's right, uh, the harder it's going to be to use the, the kind of standard multicultural argument to say, unless we enact policies that say, uh, increased funding for multicultural education or, uh, you know, policies of national self-determination to give regional autonomy to, to different groups and so forth. Um, the more of a shared culture there actually turned out to be uh, between those groups, the, the weaker those arguments would become precisely because individual lives would presumably not fare so poorly uh, if the status quo were retained, whereas, you know, the, the opposite view, if it turns out that there really is more otherness uh, and uh, difference between cultures, um, that would provide a reason, uh, and a fairly strong reason for enacting public policies that would allocate resources or uh, draw political boundaries in, in very different ways. Can I say something sure. about this? Yes. Um, it does have um, very considerable implications, and I'm glad that you raised this, this question. Some of them are sort of fairly low level. Um, public education in a multicultural society is um, presented with all sorts of aims. One is to try and make the unfamiliar familiar. One of them is to try and make the familiar unfamiliar, a little bit more unfamiliar than it would be. Um, and it's going to make a difference how one thinks about the relationship between whatever it is that children are learning about the diversity of cultures to how they are to think about their own responsibilities as citizens in common communities. It's important, obviously, in things like language politics. Uh, and uh, in Canada, that's been a very important um, uh, matter. It's important in thinking about how far the law should have a one-size-fits-all approach to the solving of social problems, disputes, and offenses, or how far it is appropriate for the law to respect and accommodate uh, some cultural differences. And uh, a number of us have thought about the varieties of ways in which um, a complicated legal system can do this. Then there are questions about, as Alex said, boundaries and the structures of governance. Uh, um, 
in the United States, we have dependent um, sovereign nations uh, for a number of indigenous peoples with uh, large tracts of lands under uh, some semi-autonomous uh, jurisdiction. And there are questions about what the point of that is, apart from it being dictated by treaty obligation, but what the point of the treaty obligations was, and how we should think about it in the modern world, and particularly how we should think about the um, relationship of laws made within these communities to laws made for the wider uh, um, uh, nation. Uh, there are issues elsewhere, Canada, Australia, uh, quite remarkably recently, about how, how much in the way of regional self-determination is important. And regional self-determination might be tremendously important if we accept the trajectory of some of the arguments that Alex was making or some of the arguments that Joseph was making, that it is tremendously important for Aboriginal communities, Torres Strait Islander communities in Australia, to somehow be in charge of, to a greater extent, in charge of the trajectory of the growth of their own way of life, rather than that way of life floating and being largely at the mercy of uh, much more dominant forms uh, around it. Um, and then just generally how to think about the basis of political community, whether political community is ultimately to be thought of as a cultural community, or whether, as I think, political communities should be set up to facilitate the interaction of those who misunderstand one another rather than those who implicitly do understand, uh, sort of stand with Kant and Hobbes on this, as opposed to those who identify cultural community with um, uh, uh, political community. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, next to Professor Kateb, our, our colleague in the program at Law and Public Affairs. Marianne Case. Thanks. Jeremy, I'm hoping you can uh, help me map the debate onto a particular set of public policy and legal issues that I'm obsessively thinking about, which concern the demands for accommodations by Muslims in Western Europe, particularly with respect to matters of sex and gender, uh, veiling by teachers and students, uh, sex segregation in various public spaces, uh, arranged marriage. As I understand Raz's argument as you present it, it can fairly easily be mobilized by the likes of Pim Fortines and myself uh, to say that you know we here in the Netherlands or France or uh, England or Germany have our own culture which has thoroughly and successfully integrated the sexes and you accept it or get out or don't bother coming in. Um, whereas your view would be uh, more readily mobilized or more in sympathy with uh, the German school teacher Faresh to Ludin and the judges of the German Constitutional Court who supported her that said that having the option she was asking for to be both an observant Muslim and a participant, an active participant in public German society um, was a, a good that um, the unitary culture uh, should submit to. Whereas again, the, 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 I, seeing the face you made, let me try and make the Pim Fortines argument more attractive, that you know, sometimes melange is not a good thing uh, sometimes the, the culture that, that or, you know, it can be defended uh, as it exists and melange would make it worse. Yes. Um, certainly, I, I mean, I think we should be hostile to any argument of the form um, as said by somebody in the Netherlands, this is the culture we have and you either like it when you come in or you get out and go somewhere else. Um, that seems to me to be as atrocious a form of argument in that cultural context as it would be in any cultural context. Cultures are, in a way, enduring solutions or proposed solutions to problems. So we have a problem about regulating families and violence within the family and, and uh, equality uh, between men and women. And we have a public debate about that, and we have a particular upshot of that public debate from time to time. And along comes somebody with a different view about these matters. We have to listen to see whether there's anything to be heard in that view because we can't strut around defending uh, our policies just because they are ours. We, strut, we should strut around defending them because we think they are best. But you can only defend something of its best if you've actually listened to the best that can be said against it. So in that sense, um, I think there is a, there's a sort of a, there's a kind of a, a mistake to reify cultures. 
and to think what's important is the preservation of a culture. When we think it's important to maintain the equality between men and women, we don't think that's important because it's our culture. We think it's important to maintain the equality between men and women. And what is said in other cultures challenges that head on, and that challenge needs to be answered. If we can't answer it, we should change our policy. So in that sense, I, uh, the, the second line of argument is that, that is, we are not entitled to be complacent about anything on this melange account. And if melange contributes to dismissing complacency about the things that are most dear to us, I think that is a very good thing, uh, not a bad thing. Now, on the other hand, we don't want there to be a cheerful diversity of ways of responding homicidally to one's spouse's adultery. And a lot of what is said, for example, about uh, cultural accommodations in the criminal law has that sort of idiotic flavor. We're in favor of diversity. In this culture, a person confronted with adultery goes and gets a divorce. In that culture, the person confronted with adultery drowns herself. In this culture, the person confronted with adultery beats the the spouse to death. What could be more delightful than this? Uh, I mean, I agree that that's, that's <laughs> an inappropriate use of the diversity metric. We have a debate about what to do about these things, and cultures should be understood as contributions to that debate, rather than as things which are to be tiptoed around. Can I, can I just clarify? It's not so much um, we're our way or the highway or, or best without discussion, but that, that Arguably, there are different ways of instantiating the equality of the sexes through separate spheres or through integration, but that that is a choice for which a melange is not an improvement, that segregation and integration can't be mixed, although each might be uh, an appropriate choice in itself. That's, that's exactly right. There are some choices that have to be made and have to be faced, right? And um, we have to determine a common view on these. and. So on, on all sorts of issues, we have the, I mean, on some issues, we can just let a 1,000 flowers blossom. And that's the approach I would take to veiling. Somebody wants to veil themselves and thinks that they think that they ought to. That's fine. Somebody doesn't. That's fine as well. There's no reason to have a party line or a community line on these matters. On other issues, we do have to take a common view and there's going to be intense disagreement about how to draw this boundary between things on which we do need a common view and things on which we um, don't. Once we determine that we do need a common view, then rival cultures become propositional contributions to the debate about what that common view should be, rather than things that the common view has to tiptoe around. And that's the way that I would look at it. But I, I mean, I must say just, just now in terms of gut reaction to the particular issue of uh, veiling and headscarves that I do recoil viscerally and I hope also intellectually from a view that says this is something on which we need a common uh, 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 consideration. It's, it's, that's, that's just a, a terribly intolerant uh, and miserable way of proceeding. Uh, in these matters. But there are things like structure of the marketplace, family violence, the regulation of children, on which it is patent that we need to have a common view. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, Professor Levine uh, in the back. Thank you. I, I think I'm going to ask Professor Kateb's question again, but I'm going to do it anyway. I was having the same. Uh, uh, thoughts about the meaning of autonomy uh, during the discussion. Um, but from the opposite point of view, Professor Kateb talked about sort of the very dramatic, agonistic actions which one might think of as uh, part of autonomy um, that don't involve the menu of choice. But I was wondering from someone who maybe from the outside appears to be standing still or not doing anything. And so I mean, both of you in the question and answer Alex and Jeremy talked about the importance of reflection and choice as a key constituent for, of autonomy. And so I was wondering, someone who um, you know, might not have many or any options in front of them that, are, uh, that get at the key of what one might uh, think of as uh, 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 autonomous, other than to sort of accept Right or 
start their own new path. Right? And Professor Katev, I think, talked about starting one's own new path very dramatically. But what about someone who's in a position and through reflection and choice decides that what they have is sufficient and perhaps even the best possible thing for them? Would that person be autonomous? I mean, I think, I think that would be a, an example of what I was referring earlier to where we're forced to ask the question, uh, is what's really more important the endorsement of a particular way of life by the person who's leading it, you know, seeing the worth of it, uh, committing themselves to it. Uh, and autonomy is often a helpful way of getting there, right? So in other words, it's more likely to be the case that if people are given a, an array of choices, you know, if, if, uh, if, you, if you tell the child you can wear one of these three things and the child picks one, the child is more likely to be happy about it than if you just hand them one, even if it's the one the child would have picked, right? And that, that may be a, a fairly common feature of the way, uh, the way human, beings, uh, human beings choose. Now, I think it's also possible, you know, you, you raised the example, what if somebody has no choices at all, right? But they, they still sort of go through this, this reflective process. I mean, the, the example that came to my mind is you can imagine, you know, the, the Apostle Paul, you know, being blinded uh, by the light and, and feeling there is only one, there, there's no choice here about what his life is going to be from here on out. He simply sort of responds and endorses this new life that uh, has been handed to him. Uh, such a life might be one of value, but I, I doubt he would have described it as one of autonomy, right? So the, the other danger we have to be worried about is, is either making the mistake of thinking autonomy is the only valuable thing there is in life. And so therefore, if something is valuable, we have to come up with some way of describing it as, as autonomous, whereas, uh, there may be value in a life simply because the goods it pursues are good and worthy ends to pursue. And we can you know, describe the worth of the life in that way, but not necessarily use the language of autonomy to describe it. Yeah. Can I just briefly respond? Um, I can't see where the question is. I'm sorry. Um, I, I think there's no reason at all to say that the life that you describe could not be understood as an autonomous life. I mean, if it's, we're just talking about a momentary endorsement, yeah, yeah, that seems fine to me, and then carry on as before, as opposed to an endorsement which therefore affects the flavor in which the life is lived, flavor, but it affects the way the life is lived or the, how, one, how one reconciles oneself to, to that life. Now, there may be two ways in which that could be true. It could be that the endorsement and the reflection and judgment that the endorsement involved permeate how one subsequently lives and nuance and maybe even change in effect uh, make a difference to how that particular life is chosen. Uh, or it might be the case that because the nature of the choice is a sort of a threshold choice, a entering a monastery style of choice, where there's going to be no opportunity for the reflective judgment made at the endorsement to nuance or change the way the life is lived once you, the door has closed behind you and you have entered. But even so, the sense of how I am living in this life is uh, its not referred back to the moment of endorsement, but it's referred back to the spirit of endorsement that animates it. And it may be that it's very weird to require that of all lives, that there are circumstances in which it makes sense to require that, others where it doesn't. Autonomy may not be the be-all and end-all. Um, we're actually scheduled to conclude right now. Um, have we worn you out? Uh, can you take another five minutes and sure. get some more questions here? Uh, Professor Brubaker. I also want to get to policy, uh, but I, I think this is also conceptual in the sense that I want to understand more clearly the importance of uh, range and ease of choice and depth of choice. And let me just give you then the concrete problem of Iraq and the territory of, of Iraq. And by the criterion of autonomy, would we have a better territory uh, if it becomes a liberal democracy uh, in which all of the cultural differences there just sort of bleach out? And so one could go uh, fishing in the Shia area in the morning, breed Sunni cattle in the afternoon, so to speak, and criticize Kurdish theater in the evening. Uh, so you, know, you have a wide range of choices, and, but the differences you know, just sort of bleach out. They're not, you know, 
terribly important. They're sort of like, it's, uh, you know, reading Grimm's Fairy's Tale in the evening and having pizza, those sorts of things. That's situation A. Let me put the other one as situation Z and tell me where, whether A or Z or somewhere in between is better. Uh, Z is where you have a Kurdish region, which is a liberal democracy, sort of, but clearly dominated by Kurdish culture. One can move into it, but you know, it's a little harder to survive if you don't speak Kurdish. And then you have two, you have two regions that are more grounded in, in their, uh, the religious belief, so that you, the point here being that you have these really rich, deep cultures, depth of, of, of meaning, and you can, move, you can move among these, but so, with some cost. The choice is it's not just you have ragged edges when you move from one to the other, but there's a transformation of meaning. Uh, so is, is uh, situation A or Z best, or is it F, H, or whatever? Um, I, th I think that one thing about Raz's argument is uh, it acknowledges the fact that cultures can change over time, right? That they're not static entities, that they interact with each other. And over time, and we've seen this in the United States, and, and something conceivably could happen in Iraq along the same lines, where cultures that were at one point very distinct over the course of time sufficiently merge that they have the kind of fluidity that you were describing. Um, I think on Raz's argument, if that actually happened, it would be fine, right? Because then the people would be presented with a, a valuable range of options from which they could choose, and but there's no problem. You're describing A. Uh, you're describing A? Right, right. Yeah, okay, right. Um, but it, it could also be uh, the case that a, a society of distinct cultures could be fine, too. In other words, I don't, I don't think his argument provides us for a reason a priori to say uh, over the long haul, all the cultures being preserved in their current form is necessarily a good thing. Um, what he'd be more interested in asking is, of the policy options available to us, given where we're at right now, how are the lives of people likely to be affected by pursuing them? And so there, actually, I think we have to start raising some hard questions about, even if we decided that A and B were, in principle, equally good if we could get there, um, we may decide that we don't have policies that are reliably sure of getting us there uh, in the case of A. Uh, and B, it could be that the transaction costs of getting to A are very, very high, right? So in other words, if uh, it's going to involve uh, hundreds of thousands of people dying uh, to, to get to A, I mean, that becomes a pretty strong reason for choosing option B. On the other hand, if we find that choosing option B, the long-term result is going to be terrible oppression of people within each of those groups, that's going to count as an opposite reason. But I don't, I don't think the logic of the argument necessarily points to one or the other um, being better. It, just, it was A and Z. I meant to put them at endpoints of a continuum and okay. not really how hard is it to get there, but which one would be a better society, A mm -hmm. or Z or somewhere in between. Well, you can ask which one would be a better society without considering what Alex gently called the transi <laughs> transition costs. Um, given the costs that would actually be involved in moving to and sustaining this sort of split, the unimaginable horror of ethnic cleansing and intercommunal violence beyond anything that we are seeing at the moment uh, to split the country into regions, the unimaginable horror that would be involved in policing subsequent fault lines within the regions to maintain the region's uh, a separateness from one another. Only a much worse horror of a sort that we haven't seen yet could justify that, and I don't think any role would be played in the justification by some argument about how wonderful it would be for autonomy if people have uh, integrated cultural environments in which to work. I think, for the reasons that I said, that's not wonderful at all. It's probably a bad thing. But um, I think there is a certain sort of staggering irresponsibility among uh, uh, people who talk about the importance of culture for national self-determination uh, in approach to the formation of, of um, political communities. What we need is some sort of grown-up sense of political community as a, uh, a basis of law and judgment between people who don't necessarily, I mean, as I said before, who don't necessarily understand one another and share a culture and who need government and law precisely for that reason. Even with the cost of bleaching out 
agricultural debts uh, by assumption. Well, even at the cost of whatever would happen to, to cultural differences in that sense, I mean, I, I, I have all people, don't, I don't want to make a fetish yeah. of the colors that would be bleached out uh, in this way. Professor Shaw? Uh, in the front here. I think my question might sound a bit trivial after the Iraq discussion. It was more generally about cosmopolitanism. I'm, I think, like you, drawn to a cosmopolitan ideal and recoil from self-conscious cultural parochialism. Englishness is something I find abhorrent as a self-conscious ideal. But at the same time, a lot of the goods that I admire culturally are the product of self-conscious parochialism, like Italian food, French wine, German music. And so I suppose I have to think that I do respect the value of those traditions and those parochial cultures in generating the kinds of goods that we admire. But insofar as I'm a multiculturalist for that reason, I'm treating people in those cultures instrumentally in relation to my own ends. So at, so at the same time, I can see the value of an account of respect for their cultures that's rooted in something like autonomy, because otherwise, sophisticated cosmopolitanism <clears throat> does look as though it's treating other cultures instrumentally. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that's, that's important. It's important not to exaggerate um, the parochial origins of any particular cultural element. Um, we assume that once upon a time there was a whole array of separate integrated cultures, each one integrated within itself but separate from the others, and that they produced these marvelous things like Italian food and German music. And now, either horror of horrors or now, thank God, they have come together in a form that make these various goodies available for all of us. I'm attracted by a different picture, which is that things have been kind of sort of cosmopolitan all the way down. And, uh, uh, humans have moved across the face of the earth since we evolved. Humans have shown intense interest in one another's cultural forms and cultural solutions um, over the last uh, uh, 5,000 years. Um, humans are the sort of animals that move between cultures um, as traders, as merchants, as soldiers, as preachers, as diplomats, and that's as an important a part of the heritage of many of the cultural forms that we value as the purely local origins of a particular cuisine. And I think particularly when you get to those cultural forms that are of huge importance to us rather than just the hobbies and the tastes, uh, this then becomes enormously important when you think about the great world religions. All of them are cosmopolitan in scope and cosmopolitan often in origin. Um, uh, when they haven't been cosmopolitan in origin, they have been conscious of the cosmopolitan dimension and have addressed themselves to this. Many of the moral achievements, it isn't just that there happened to be a cultural community in Königsberg that came up with a categorical imperative and how bad it would be to destroy that cultural enclave because then we mightn't get that. This is the product of something that uh, um, started two or 3,000 miles away and two or 3,000 years away uh, in time and in place. So I think it's very, very important not to work with a, a notion that there once were self-contained cultural communities and now they've come together. Often it's been melange all the way down. Uh, Professor Raz, did you want to uh, say anything now or you want to hold your fire un until uh, later today? Okay, thank you. Well, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Professor Waldron and Professor Tuckness.